Let me pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, this morning we are getting back into John. You remember that we uh, left John last year when we went into our psalm series, but now we're coming back around and we're diving back into John again, head first, picking up where we left off with uh, John chapter 12, at least the first part of John chapter 12. But as we get ourselves back into the game, back into the mindset of John, we ask the question, why did John write this gospel? Like, why did he feel the need to write this gospel? It's likely that he was at the end of his life when this uh, gospel was written. Uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke were probably already in uh, big circulation. So why did John feel the need to have to pen this book? Well, the, the cheat's answer is because the Holy Spirit inspired him to do that, obviously. But John actually tells us why he wrote this book at the, towards the end of the book. He talks about the fact that Jesus performed many other signs. He records a bunch of them, but Jesus pre- pre- performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that is the anointed one, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see that? He's written John so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What a good reason to write a record of Jesus' life so that you can have life. You here today can have that life. So we are in the midst of uh, John, and this turning point that we are up to at the moment is... uh, the climax, we've, we hit the climax of the signs with Lazarus. Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus got sick, he died. Jesus, uh, well, before he died, he got the message, Lazarus is sick, please come quickly. They're thinking, if Jesus can get here in time, he can heal Lazarus. But, but Jesus said, oh, no, I'm just going to wait around here for a little bit longer. So that Lazarus died. Like he held off coming so that he could arrive after Lazarus had died and heal Lazarus by raising him from the dead. So this resurrection of Lazarus is the is the high point. Like this is the this is the most uh, crazy thing that Jesus has done, the most magnificent thing that Jesus has done. He has given life to a dead man. And so this is the turning point of the book. Now with this climax of the signs displaying Jesus' power, now it's turning and we are looking specifically at the final week of Jesus' life. So it turns from the signs and the mostly story to the final week of Jesus' life. And there's a lot of teaching throughout this last week. A lot of teaching. So that's what we will basically be looking at from here. But it's not going to get uninteresting because even though the narrative kind of side of things are slowing down, There's a lot more uh, teaching that needs to be unpacked, a lot more intriguing stuff to talk about. A lot to chew on. So in this passage that we're looking at specifically this morning, these first 26 verses of chapter 12, what we have here is seven different approaches to Jesus. Seven different approaches to Jesus. Now, even though there's seven, three of them are actually, uh, well, six of them are in couplets. So they're like parallels, or sorry, not parallels, opposing. So the first two oppose each other. Three and four oppose each other. Five and six oppose each other. And so conveniently for you who like uh, dot points and numbering systems, I've called them A and B. One A, one B. Two A, two B. So we're going to walk through these together and see how people oppose or accept Jesus Christ in these, how people approach Jesus Christ. How do people approach Jesus? Because in the end, the world is very binary. We, we understand that there's different, uh, there's strength and there's shades, but in the, some of the most important things, it, there is still a digital way that the world works. There are people who are dead or alive. There is light or dark, there is male or female, there is holy or unholy, there is slave or free. 
And when it comes to Jesus, we have to approach him in a binary way as well. It's either in or out. There's not half ways with Jesus. And John in his gospel consistently highlights this, consistently highlights that there is no half ways with Jesus. Because there are people who want some of Jesus, but not all of him. There are people who want to make themselves feel better about religion and faith, but they don't want to go the whole way. They don't want to make any sacrifices. There are people who want to pay lip service to Jesus, but then adopt whatever loopy bandwagon is most popular next week. We see that in the world today. How many people will say, oh yes, I'm a Christian, yes, I belong to Jesus, but their life is in the same shape as the rest of the world which rejects Jesus. So how do people approach Jesus? Well, the first approach of Jesus, to Jesus we get is honouring Jesus at his feet. Honouring Jesus at his feet. This is how Beth, Mary of Bethany approaches Jesus. Remember, this is not Mary Magdalene. This is not Mary, the mother of, uh, of Jesus, or, or Mary, the mother of John. Just to confuse you with all the Marys. This is Mary of Bethany, Mary, Lazarus' sister. So after the miracle, Jesus had gone underground for a bit. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, he, Jesus went underground. He, he skipped town because they were trying to kill him. He, he laid low for a little while. But now that the Passover festival is coming up, people are wondering to see if Jesus is going to make an appearance. And so, from the verse, first verse in chapter 12, we read the story. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. So we've got Jesus up here at a dinner at... In Bethany, and Bethany is basically where the Mount of Olives is, so it's on a, a hill opposite Jerusalem, where Jesus would later pray in the Garden of Olives before he went up to be crucified. So th this is Bethany, looking over at Jerusalem, about three kilometres away, or two miles, if you like the old language. And they threw a party for Jesus there. And of course, I'd want to throw a party for the bloke who just raised me from the dead. That's a no-brainer. <laughs> So Lazarus and his sisters are there. Re Lazarus is reclining at the table. If you know the other story about Martha, you would be unsurprised to hear that Martha is serving. So then here we've got Mary who takes a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So here's Mary using an expensive ointment to make Jesus smell really good. But this was a really humbling thing for Mary to do. You know, even though we don't have all that, the same hang-ups uh, that uh, ancient Middle Eastern people do around feet, um, we would still, it would be hugely humbling uh, for one of us to go to another person and try and uh, put perfume on their feet with your hair. Like that's an in a very humbling thing to do, a hugely kind of devotional thing to do. Mary's actions indicate an expression of intense personal devotion to Christ. And while some people are tempted to read things into the story, this isn't a romantic thing. Jesus, Mary isn't trying to come on to Jesus or anything. This is Jesus showing her love and devotion to her, to her master, her spiritual leader, her saviour, the one who rescued her brother from the dead. And interestingly, in the stories about Mary of Bethany, you always find her at Mary's feet. When we read, I think it's in Luke, we find Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus to hear him teach. At the death of her brother, Mary threw herself at the feet of Jesus as she mourned for her brother, but also expressed trust in Jesus, despite the fact that her brother had just died. And here we have her at Jesus' feet, giving him this extravagant, humble gift, showing her devotion. It's humbly administered. This is not for show. This is the example of one who approaches Jesus through love and devotion, who trusts him and would give anything to him, including some perfume that is worth a year's wages. Imagine you, you, you saved up everything you earned for a whole year 
didn't spend money on anything else, and you went out and bought a bottle of perfume that was worth that whole year's wages. And she is using it on Jesus' feet. This is a huge amount of money being poured out to Jesus. She was willing to give him the best gift that she could give. A huge gift. Many are not willing to give everything to Jesus. And that's the opposite side of this couplet. The opposite approach to Jesus, which is not giving over everything to Jesus, but keeping some for oneself. We see in the other side of this couplet, the other approach is money grubbing with a holy facade. Judas interjects here. He's got an air of being a Jesus disciple, but his heart is in rebellion. He's the poster boy for deception. That's why Judas has become a byword for a traitor. His name is become a colloquial name for deception. So what does this man who's money grubbing with a holy facade, what does he say? One of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. He doesn't see an act of devotion and love to Jesus. He sees an an expensive waste. He's not interested in honouring Jesus. He's interested in his back pocket. But he uses the right words to make it sound like holiness. Oh, it's because I'm concerned about the poor. But he's not zealous for holiness, he's zealous for pilfering. He is the treasurer for the group and he takes little bits out of the money bag for himself. And there are plenty of folk like this in churches now. There are people who want to take, 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 people who want to take from the flock as uh, leaders, shepherds who uh, want to uh, just take from God's people and line their own pockets. Or there are people who come to church and come to God to try and get more i come to god and if if i if i'd put in my hours if i put in my time god will bless me if i sow my seed god will bless it and fill my pockets that's a misuse of of god's word by the way people who come to church to make good impressions and grow business connections they come to church to network And I'm sure you've heard plenty of stories about treasurers who nick off with the church savings account. And I'm not making any accusations about Steve. I'm just saying there are plenty who've done that before. There are people who would steal from their own family, supporting their personal outlandish spending habits while the rest of the family goes without. Berating your spouse for spending too much on essential groceries while you you drop wads of cash on selfish projects. But it's not just around money. There are plenty of us who have the holy spiritual facade that is actually covering up a life of rebellion underneath. Because it starts out small, like Judas. I'm sure the first time he took the money, he was like, oh, I'm going to pay this back. And then I'm sure it turned from a one-time thing into a pattern. But not long after, it becomes betraying his master for 30 silver coins. This is the deceitfulness of sin. It metastasizes. And so even though the, the appearance is on the outside, yes, I'm part of Jesus' disciples. Yes, I'm, I'm one of the 12. It's got this position of um, great honor. Yet, underneath the facade, the sin was metastasizing. Jesus rebukes Judas' approach and commends the reckless, in inverted commas, the reckless expenditure that Mary was doing leave her alone jesus replied it was intended that she should give this uh, should save this perfume for the day of my burial you will always have the poor among you but you will not always have me and so jesus is saying you don't need to choose between giving to the poor and giving to me i'm here with you the bridegroom was there with them they should celebrate they should anoint him they should bless him it's a it's appropriate that jesus was honored in this way 
yes, you should give to the poor, yes, we, but giving to Jesus doesn't come at the expense of giving to the poor. It's as if Mary anointed Jesus' body for burial. If not in that moment, it's like she should keep, the way that it's said, uh, she should uh, save this perfume for the day of my burial. If there was some left over, it's as though she should keep that for a week's time. Mary, Mary happily gives a year's wages to show her love to Jesus, while Judas wishes that he could have some of that wealth for himself. He cannot abide others experiencing wealth and joy because he's covetous and unwilling to give thanks to God for, the, for what others have, what others have been blessed with. And then he covers it over with a pretend concern for the poor. Now, I can sure you can see these two approaches of Jesus are very different. One with an air of spirituality that is really covering up betrayal and one that is devotion and love. One needs to repent. That is the one who is selfish. They need to repent. Judas needs to repent. And if that, explain, if that description covers you, then you need to repent. We see another couplet of people who approach Jesus. They respond to the good news. Responding to the good news. So this other way to approach Jesus uh, is uh, we see when the dinner has been going on, people have been hearing, oh, Jesus is back in town. That guy who rose Lazarus from the dead, he's back. He's back having dinner up at Lazarus' place. And so word starts to spread and people start to come. They want to come and see the bloke who rose, rises people from the dead. A, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. So the news had been spreading, people coming to see Jesus. They wanted, they were responding to the message that was going out that there is a man who raises people from the dead. This is an approach to Jesus on the basis of coming to see the one who made these things, to see if this guy was really true, if he was real. Has he really risen Lazarus from the dead? And this is a good way to approach Jesus, to see, come and see what, what is true. There are plenty of opinions out there about who Jesus is, but it's good for us to come to Jesus and hear what he has to say about himself. Come and see if the words find reality in Jesus. And, and any true church will be a mouthpiece for this good news, that Jesus does indeed have the power to save over death. And if you come to him, he will save you from eternal death resurrecting you like he did for Lazarus. Yet coming to see Jesus is not enough. We've seen across the pages of John that there are those who come to see Jesus for selfish reasons. They came to put food in their bellies. They followed Jesus when it was easy and when things got a little bit tough, they split. So yes, the approach to Jesus to come and see is good, the, to respond to the good news, to come and to and to see and investigate. But you need to come humbly. You need to come ready to accept, if this message is true, that will mean that my life will change forever. But the opposite side to this is a plot to overthrow Jesus and his people, in particular Lazarus. This is the opposite. Instead of coming and investigating, coming to see Jesus, coming to meet Jesus, they reject Jesus. They plot to undermine Jesus, overthrow him and his people. The chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. This is the nature of Christian faith, isn't it? Jesus is the one who gets it all going and starts it, He's the, the, the one that kicks it all off and then his followers are problems <laughs> because they go and they tell other people about who Jesus is and what he does. And Lazarus, because of Lazarus, because he was there, because he was proof in the pudding that Jesus was the guy who raises people from the dead, they wanted to get rid of him as well. They wanted to get rid of Lazarus because of what Jesus was doing. So these chief priests, these are guys who work up at the temple and they were overseeing the rituals and worship there. 
They were the ones who should have known God's word. They were the ones who should have recognized Jesus coming because they were immersed in the scriptures. But instead of coming to see the fulfillment of the scriptures before their very eyes, they want to dampen God's will. They want to take out God's chosen anointed messenger. They rejected him. And this wasn't just confined to Christianity. It started there with God's priests in his temple being the ones who were trying to take out God's anointed one. But it has been a pattern throughout history. Wherever Christians are persecuted. And, and usually it's by the authorities. Sometimes there's a mob that gets whipped up and they go out and destroy a church or persecute Christians in some way. But the most often, persecution comes from the authorities, comes from the top down. People trying to wipe out the gospel of Jesus Christ and his Christians. And it happens even in God's church. A particular example I think of is, the, is with John Huss. I think he was um, Chech, not a Chechenian, but from, um, yeah, from Europe. And he, uh, he wanted to preach the gospel to people. He wanted them to hear God's word in their own language. John Huss was, uh, was, was taken out by the church, burned at the stake for what he was trying to do. He had the audacity to suggest that Christians should take both elements in the Lord's Supper. And he was burned at the stake for it. People trying to take out God's message can come from within. But even though the rejection comes from the authorities, even though the rejection comes from people you thought you should be able to trust, this is not the way that we should approach God. It's not us who get to dictate to God how things are. He is the one who teaches us how to live, how to respond. He's the one who comes to us. It's not for us to overthrow and undermine his people. And if we are doing that, then we need to repent. In our third couplet, we see that... Uh, there are those who herald and honour Jesus. Those who herald and honour Jesus. We see the growing number of people gathering together, looking to Jesus in faith, and they are heralding his coming, and they are honouring him. You see that in John 12, verse 12. The next day, this is after the feast, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. So the news was spreading that Jesus had come to the Passover festival. And, they, and so they came and they found him as he was going up to Jerusalem. Jews had traveled in from all over the place to come and worship God at this festival. And it's almost like they felt the moment has come. Our King is here. Finally, after all these years of waiting, a King of Israel has arrived. They thought maybe this will be the moment that Jesus will return and face the powers that be. They took the palm branches. They used parts of Psalm 118 to, to herald his coming, saying, Hosanna, which means save us. Save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And while this was happening, Jesus was also fulfilling a prophecy from Zechariah. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified, they did realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. The promises they had long expected were being fulfilled right before their very eyes. Yet even the disciples didn't put all the pieces together until later. This was a wonderful moment. Put yourself in that atmosphere. We've been waiting so long and now the king is coming and he is riding up to Jerusalem. Come thou long expected Jesus. And this is a right and proper way to approach Jesus. 
to approach him and give him the pride of place, to recognize him as God's king over God's people, to herald his coming into the world. But unfortunately for these folks on that day, they had some misconceptions about what it would look like for Jesus to become king. They wanted him to go up to get rid of the Romans and to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. But Jesus was going to go up and get rid of Satan's sin and death and be crowned with thorns. He was coming to be crowned, but not the way they expected. But nevertheless, this is still the right way to come to Jesus with honour he deserves, to herald his coming. But the wrong way, the, the way that we aren't supposed to approach Jesus, is to despair over his influence, which is what the Pharisees do. They bemoan the coming of Christ. The news continued to spread about Jesus and they're like, oh no, the whole world has gone after him. The crowd was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb, raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many, peop many people, because they'd heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. And then the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. It's obviously, it's a bit of an overstatement, but the point being, they feel like they've lost. They were trying to kill him, they were trying to take him out, but their efforts had all come to nothing. It seems to them like everybody's lost their mind and they're all following Jesus. It just brings to mind, me, to my mind, those today who think that Christians have lost their mind, that they're crazy for believing this Bible stuff. They lambast Christians for being, they say, you're uncritical thinkers. And they try to undermine the gospel message with their academic language and their self-righteous indignation, as if they were here to save us from our saviour. Those who want to push Jesus away, they need to repent. Those who uh, are sad at the, at the spread of Christianity, they need to repent and see that this is actually what will save the world. But then we get this last approach to Jesus, a curious approach to Jesus. Lots of people had heard about Jesus. He had this growing following. It was, the festival was there, so people had travelled in from all over the place to worship. And some interesting people come to investigate Jesus. They came to seek Jesus' presence. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. And Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. So, these are Greeks. We don't know who these Greeks were. The Greek was spoken by a whole heap of people all over that region. Uh, and remember, this is past the heyday of the Greek Empire, but there was plenty of people who spoke Greek, even some Jews who spoke Greek as a first language from places like Alexandria. So, we don't know who these Greeks are exactly, but... Based on the context, these seem to be people who have converted to Judaism. They're people who have given up the worship of the, of the pagan pantheon and they have turned to the God of Israel. And they've come up to the Passover festival to worship. But they've heard about this Jesus. And so they come and they want to, they want to meet him. And this is significant because it's a sign of people outside God's people coming in. It's a sign of the message about the God of Israel spreading to other nations. A trickle at this time, but a trickle coming in nonetheless. They heard about Jesus and they wanted to come and investigate. They wanted to come into his presence. They wanted to meet him face to face. And this is an admirable endeavor because naturally we are outside of Jesus and we need to come in to him and seek his presence. Here on a physical sense, they hadn't sought Jesus. But for us on a spiritual sense, we need to seek Jesus. We need to come to him. We are lost in our sin. We are separated from the one who resurrects the dead. We need to seek Jesus and know him. I don't know the significance of this little exchange here between uh, Philip and Andrew. Uh, but, but they go and they tell Jesus. And then... Annoyingly, Jesus doesn't really deal with the Greeks. We've got this little 
entourage of Greeks come up and they want to talk to Jesus, but then the story kind of switches and we don't actually hear what happened with the Greeks. But it's an occasion, it's important because of the way Jesus responds to this news that there were some Greeks who wanted to see him. How does Jesus respond to these inquirers? We get this little epilogue to our passage, the path of salvation, the path of salvation. This is how Jesus responds to the news that Greeks are coming to talk to him. They want to come and see him. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and it dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So here we have Jesus saying, the hour has come. If you remember from across the pages of John, I think it's about five times now, Jesus keeps saying, the hour has not yet come. The hour has not yet come. The hour has not yet come. And now when some Greeks turn up to talk to him, on the eve of the Passover, he says, the hour has come. This is a a big moment. This, This moment is almost like, there's this pressure building with the, with the Pharisees wanting to kill him and, and Lazarus, with the people bringing their, their fronds and, and heralding the coming of the Messiah, with the Greeks wanting to come and meet Jesus. The hour has arrived. The moment is here. What has been leading up to this time, this building pressure, it's all coming to a head. And how does Jesus describe what is about to happen? With an agricultural metaphor. A seed A tiny little seed, all by itself, is nothing, it seems. But when it falls to the ground, it dies, metaphorically speaking. A seed dies. And out of that death comes new life. The seed brings forth a plant, which brings forth more seed. It it brings forth fruitfulness, multiplication. It it reminds me of uh, Joseph who goes down, he dies in the sense that he is is lost to his family and he goes down into Israel. But then, because of his metaphorical death and separation, he is then able to bring life to his family because he provides for their needs in the famine that is to come. There's plenty of death and resurrection metaphors throughout the Bible. And here is one that Jesus uses. He dies to bring life to many. And this is what Jesus was about to do, to die alone on that cross to bring life to many to bring resurrection to all if it dies it produces many seeds Jesus came to die on that cross which was coming just around the corner but this path was not just for Jesus to walk Jesus was going to carve a path for others to follow he goes on to say anyone who loves their life will lose it while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Jesus calls his disciples, the ones who would follow after him, to follow in his footsteps. To follow in his footsteps. They need to lose their life like Jesus will lose it. Now, Jesus has gone and won salvation. I'm not suggesting that you need to go and earn your salvation like Jesus goes and wins salvation for us. But if you imagine when somebody builds a road and they go and they make a cutting through a, uh, through a hill or make the embankments to get the road up out of the, the creek, they go and prepare the path. They go and do all the hard work and then you can walk and follow that road with ease. Now, it might not seem easy to give up your life But the point is that Jesus has gone before us. Jesus laid down his life. Jesus Jesus created the path for salvation and then calls you to follow him, to lay down your life like he laid down his life, to serve him, to follow him. You give up your life, all your vain desires. You give up living for yourself so that you can have life forever. You lay it down so that you can have it eternally. We give up our lives as a sacrifice to God. And yet the intriguing thing here is, as Jesus lays out the path ahead for every potential disciple, as he forges this path, he says, 
My Father will honour the one who serves me. God will honour you if you follow Jesus. Have you thought about that? God honours those who follow Jesus. In this passage, we've seen people honouring Jesus and God will honour them. God will honour us if we follow Jesus. So let me just tie this all together. Repent your money-grubbing ways. Repent your desire to undermine God's people. Repent your facade of holiness that's covering up your sin. Repent your concern over the influence of God's people. Instead, love and honour Jesus with everything you have, with pure devotion. Hear the good news about Jesus Christ and come and see if what he says is true. Herald the coming of King Jesus and honour him. Come into Christ Jesus' presence and trust him. Jesus died to bring abundant life and you can have that life by walking the path of salvation behind him. And you can receive honour from God by serving this Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing that we have received through Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that the way that we approach Jesus might be the way that brings honour and glory to you, that we might approach you on your terms and not on our own, and that we would reject every way which rejects Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.